and we are live. So um, I'll let you guys um, kick it off however you feel to do it. And then. Hey, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever that you are. Uh, we invite you today to receive the word of God here. I'm so proud to be associated with Shane Mason right here. When he speaks, he's always speaking the word of God, but I want you to understand one thing, that when he speaks, the voice of God is coming out from within him. And I just want you to come and join us, grab a pen and paper, whatever that you need, write something down. You know, I always say it only just takes one word sometimes just to declare the victory. You don't know what it is. Don't miss out on what God is doing this year. And when he does it, he does it abundantly. And I just want to give, you know, the Lord the honor and the glory. But I also want to just lift this man up right here right now for being obedient, regardless of the situations in his life. He's, he's just like me. He's willing to do whatever it is for the kingdom of God and for the people of the kingdom of God. And it is just a blessing and an honor to know a man of God like this. So, Shane... I give it to you, my brother. God bless you. Amen, amen. I love you guys. I'm very, very, very thankful that um, the Lord has, has began wo um, woving, that's not a word, weaving, weaving, weaving a relationship together of, of people like Precious Faith. And, you know, we use that terminology and we all should have like Precious Faith. But I think it's, I think that scripture means a little bit more than just the faith that was delivered once and for all, but it's perhaps the ability to relate, to understand each other in a, in a deeper way that's than just the surface level. And man, I tell you this, these people right here, Raymond and Linda specifically, because I know them, um, these are people I can run with. Uh, this is you know it's amazing to me that i can see people in ministry for 30 and 40 years and if you have a disagreement with them they get offended and then it, you know and it's like a i'm gonna take my ball and go home I, i'm up you know reason why it's like that i think it's because for so many people though probably unwillingly it's become a game it's become a show it's become a it's become a really it's become a competition and the gospel was never, ever, ever designed to be any form of competition. The gospel is about turning the lights on in the places of darkness so that people can see him. And his name is Jesus. And now we're going to talk about that. I was up pretty late last night, which is no surprise. But while I was up, one of the things began working in me. And I had a, I was actually trying to go to sleep and I was kind of in that in between state. And I've got to the place anymore that when I start feeling or hearing or perceiving insights into the revelation of the scriptures, that I can always do one or two things. I can try to go to sleep because I need it, or I can just say, hmm, you know, what is it, sucker up, buttercup? Because I'm going to get on up and I'm going to write this down because. Sometimes if I, if I have done it both ways and sometimes I'll remember, sometimes I won't and I'll, but I'll remember that I had something, but I didn't write it down. I'm like, Oh God, I hope you bring that back to me. So I feel that out of an act of obedience, sometimes even when it's, it may mean missing out a little bit more sleep, it's good to get up and learn how to watch with him in the night seasons. Because there's something special. I, you know, I know there's teachings on this. I haven't, I have not done a deep dive into it. But there's definitely something special about the night seasons with God. Perhaps it's because that when it's night season for us, it's day season for other people, you know, the way, way it works. But maybe also it's because when everybody else has gone to sleep, then you're able to let your guard down and enter into a place of rest because you're not being anxious because of the distractions, especially when you have families or little ones. So I say all that to say this, 
God is speaking, and I'm hoping that I can share a little bit with you this morning or this afternoon now of unpacking something in Matthew chapter 7 so that we can have just a little bit more insight, a little bit more light into the authentic gospel and specifically the mission that we're called into ultimately. Because, beloved, here's what I want to say as a disclaimer right up front. If what we preach, what we teach, makes Jesus a footnote to the overarching theme or narrative of our story or our message, you're not preaching the gospel. I'm not saying that there aren't people out there that can use Jesus in that sense, perhaps more in the secular world in order to be a light. But I'm saying for those who are called to be preachers and teachers, which are the DOMA, D-O-M-A, DOMA, grace gifts of Ephesians chapter four, not to be confused with the charismata or the charisma, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, the, you know, we have the nine gifts of the spirit. But we're talking about the Doma Grace gifts of Christ himself, which are the extensions of himself in the one ministry of Jesus Christ that we partake and share in the koinonia or fellowship of the faith in him. What that means, beloved, is that if you believe yourself to be an apostle or prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, a teaching gift, all of these are of and in the one and same man, Jesus Christ. So any ministry function that we find ourselves operating and flowing into is a shared ministry. So for us to especially to walk around and feel that we must be validated by putting a title in front of us, such as apostle so-and-so or teacher so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, listen, you know, there is something called the law of existing order. And the law of existing order is in such that we are, as a church, as believers in Jesus, we are on a journey. So a lot of what we do, a lot of what we um, operate in, our dogmas per se, our bylaws, even if we don't have them written down, we just do things a certain way. We kind of, because we've been shaped like this, but beloved, there's a better way. And when light comes on and you see the better way, to know to do right and to do it not, that's what sin is. Sin is when you've got light on something, but yet you refuse to be obedient to the light that God has given you. And you'll notice I use the word light a lot, L-I-G-H-C, and I will continue to do so because Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and light, I believe, is probably the most potent demonstration of what needs to be talked about, understood, so that those who are in darkness can see. It's one thing to try to tell people about Jesus from a perspective of he's over here. If you talk about him long enough, maybe they'll begin to question, wonder, and pray and receive Jesus unto themselves. It's another thing to recognize that people are in darkness, and if people are in the darkness, we need to stop trying to be the Holy Spirit and just ask Abba to turn the lights on so that they can see. And if they see, then every single thing that we preach and teach them to help them, to help build them, help disciple them, will ultimately be very fruitful because we did not start from a place of absence trying to figure out how to get them into a place of presence. But because Abba turns the lights on, we start from a place of presence. And because God has made himself real to them, they move from that into revelation. Because, beloved, anything we call revelation that does not carry with it the reality of manifestation, tangible substance, then it's not revelation. It may be insight. It may be some understanding. It may be accumulation of facts and ideas, metaphors, allegories, semiotics. But if what you have doesn't bring you into a experiential knowledge of Jesus, then the gospel you have is incomplete and perhaps maybe even a farce. Because Jesus did not go away in order to leave you orphans. He went away 
so that the one that was standing with those disciples could be in those disciples by way of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is a gospel of encounter. The gospel is a gospel of authentic spiritual substance through incarnational living, breathing, and having relationship. The gospel is relational. The gospel is organic. The gospel is life. And if you strip that, I don't know what you got. You might have a rock concert, but you don't have the gospel. That's the gospel. I want to talk to you for a few moments this morning uh, or this afternoon concerning Matthew chapter 7 story concerning the two foundations. I call this, uh, you know, I don't title messages usually. Um, I'll write things down just to keep an idea of what I'm talking about. But I, I wanted to borrow Aerosmith this morning and say fools and sages. You know, in the song Dream On, um, see, I got another screen right here in front of me. I want to read you the, the verse in that song. And this may offend some people to say, why is he going to take a verse or a line out of a rock song? Because the mystery hidden before the foundations of the earth that has now been revealed by God's holy prophets and apostles is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's nobody on this planet that has any form of being or existence outside of Christ, period. This is his earth. This is fundamental. This is the Christian faith of 2,000 years. So we have went so far away from it, and we have inverted the gospel to a place of separation, alienation, estrangement. We make God um, capricious. We make God um, in a way that he is unassuming, unavailable, perhaps the son may talk with us, but perhaps we can experience Jesus a little bit, but you know, God, the father, he's got better things to do, not recognizing or realizing that in the law of inseparable, the law of inseparable actions, or the, let me say it this way, the way the father, son, and the Holy spirit has always operated from the very beginning and will always operate is through an immutable other centered love for one another. In other words, the love and the completion of God is not because we love him. He is complete and he is filled to the fullness of all he needs because the love he loves us with is the love that completes him. So God is love. So us not loving him doesn't change his mind about us. Us not wanting to be with him doesn't change his mind about us. He loves us. And that love is the love ultimately when we realize covers multitudes of sin. Because why? Because we learned that it's not the wrath or anger or the fear of torment or judgment that brings us to a place of repentance. It may make bring us to a place of the, the false repentance, the moral, the moral idea that I'm going to cry and beat, beat my chest and say, oh, God, you know what? Um, I, I, I'm a horrible worm. I'm a, I'm a sorry sinner. I, I'm, I, I know you can never love me or forgive me, but just if you could, please just forgive me one time. This is not what brings men to repentance, and truly, this is not what repentance is. This does not mean that repentance cannot have attached to it the, the, the sorrow, because it is, so, you know, we do find that the broken heart or godly sorrow works repentance in us. But the godly sorrow isn't from the fear of torment or judgment, because Jesus, according to John 3, 16, God sent his son because he so loved us. But verse 17 says this. And God did not send his son into the world to judge or condemn the world, the cosmos, the entirety of, of, of all seen creation, but that through the son, we'd be saved. The gospel then that works sorrow or godly sorrow within our hearts is not because of fear of punishment, but rather because the lights have come on and now it's his kindness or his goodness, the goodness of God that leads men to metanoia, repentance, which is paradigm shift. I believe in our English, and I'm working this out, so I'm not going to say this definitively, but I do believe that the probably the best definition for metanoia in the English vocabulary is paradigm shift. You know, we can use the word paradigm shift many times and toss it around to and fro, back and forth, kind of like 
well, this is a paradigm. No, 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 no. We got to be careful about what that is because a paradigm shift is a major, major turning point in a life, in a family, in a community, in a culture, in a civilization. So a paradigm shift marks an event that can't be undone in your psyche or around you to the extent that you know your life is so completely altered, you'll never be the same again. This is what repentance does. Repentance is a paradigm shift that everything we thought we knew has com been completely changed, shifted. Repentance, the word metanoia um, carries or contains within it the idea that we turn from one direction to another only after the mind has been changed. So as the mind goes, we go. But if the mind's not been renewed, we kind of sometimes continue wandering around in darkness. So the great need of the church today is a true repentance, not because someone preached hellfire and brimstone, but because people wake up to the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. We want to see revival. We want awakening. We want reformation. We want to see a revolution, a Christian revel, an uprising, not one with swords and spears, but with pruning hooks and plowshares. Learning war no more because we've entered into his good graces and the good graces of our God keeps us steady, even in an ascetic life. And what I mean by that, even in the midst of suffering, in the midst of warfare, you know, there was a time in my life, beloved, that I would go enter into a place of spiritual warfare. We would be in, I'll give you the example. We were in Hamilton, Alabama in 2006, went around. I will, let me hands down, it was phenomenal. No doubt. No doubt. It was amazing. We brought a youth group. I was the associate pastor at, actually, at a church here where I live now before we moved to Jacksonville. And, um, you know, it's a pretty good-sized church for a small country area, and we brought the youth group. It was powerful. At the end of that, a man by the name of Lou Engel. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, but Lou Engel is this, this rocking, praying man. He calls us up to do a 40-day fast starting in a particular month, I think, after January or so. And the 40-day fast would end on July 7th of 2007, so 777. At the end of a 40-day fast, by the way, he, he called us all up and drew, wrote the word holy on our foreheads with a Sharpie. <laughs> we ended up in um, Nashville, Tennessee in July 7th of 2007. I think 53, 58,000 people in the stadium, hot, 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 where we had called, um, culminated or consummated that 40-day fast with worship and prayer. And it was phenomenal. It really was. But the fasting that I always found myself in was always a fasting of trying to strong arm God to get him to approve of me or to find me worthy or to see my sacrifice, you know, and beloved, even this is Old Testament, but it is obedience that always is better than sacrifice. See, when God, when you stand before God, beloved, he's not going to judge you based upon all your sacrifice. He's going to judge you based upon the talent or talents that he gave you and what you do with those is what you're going to be judged by not all those other things that you try to do because it was quote unquote a sacrifice but we're never going to truly understand and recognize fully the potential of the talents that god's given us and what we can actually do for him in this earth as burning sons and daughters burning sons burning daughters burning ones you know say well we're um you know we're all sons of God, male and female. Yeah, there's, there's truth to that. But the children of God is the Greek word technon. And it's a, it's a gender neuter um, noun. And it does not mean boy. It doesn't mean girl. It means either. It's the family of God. And then what we refer to as the mature sons, the weos. Well, that's Christ. He's the, he is the paradigm son. He is the prototype son, and he is the weos of God, and we share our life in and through him. As a matter of fact, even what we want as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Jesus, and if we share in his life and ministry, then we will on a every single day basis experience the ongoing full outpouring of the Holy Spirit, so much so 
that, beloved, I believe with all my heart, this is where we're going to begin to see the unusual miracles, the unusual signs and wonders, not just the ones that, um, that we hear about but we never see, but that there will be a witness of his supreme authority and power over darkness, over sickness and disease in the coming days. But beloved, it's not going to flow through a man or a woman who thinks they're it. It's going to operate, work, and flow through a group, a community of laid down lovers who have laid their lives down, not just for him, but one for another. And this is the gospel that brings us back to the right things, the things that will stand through the storms of life and the test of time that we are anchored and we are secure because we have found rest in him, rest that gives us peace, even in the midst of absolute hell. There is a peace of God that passeth all understanding. This is my heart. This is where I have, I can't survive without it. I promise you, my family can't hardly tolerate me outside of it. Because I am a type of a person I can get worked up quick. So anytime I feel that, that gnawing anxiety that wants to eat away at me, it's time to go into the place of secret. Say, I, I didn't know, shelter me. Shelter me from the storm. Give me the peace that only comes through the light in which I see you. Because, beloved, the way you perceive God is the way you see God. And if your perception is wrong, then the way you see God is wrong. Therefore, the way you see yourself is wrong. And the way you see everybody else is wrong. Paul said, I no longer will know any man after the flesh, but by the spirit. What does that mean? Does that mean, well, he's no longer Joe and Jim. He's just, because I see him different. No, you still see the person as who they are in the sense of their individual essence. But you don't know them by their appearance or by what they've even done in this earth, good or bad. You know them by the spirit of God. And you begin to see, because you walk in the light, authentic prophetic revelation that's not based upon cold readings or how people respond to the initial quote-unquote prophecies that begin to be spoken but you see them based upon the light that you walk in and then you can see beyond the shadows that are still present in all of us the hidden places the imposture that is still part of who we are until we shut off this human body when this corruption puts on incorruption that there is a paradox within us of divine nature and human nature that we wrestle with on a daily basis. This is what we talk about when we said we have to learn to crucify the flesh. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me. This life is a life called to martyrdom. Not necessarily in the, in the physical human flesh, but possibly. But the sake is, my brothers and sisters, we'll never, ever truly Lay our life down for him in that extent, unless we truly learn how to live for him in that extent. Because it's only in life that death is trampled. Watch, it's his death of the cross that trampled down death so that his death becomes our life. And so it's his resurrection life working in us through the sufferings and through the persecutions. And ultimately, the stand that we take for our faith. That the gospel has to become so foundational in your life that you can't let anybody talk you out of it. Now, I will tell you this. Hold perceived truth loosely. Why? Because it's many of us, especially us ministers, we, we tend to wrestle with a lot of different things that have hints of truth to see if they be of God. This is like the Bereans. They search the scriptures. But when you have come to the place where the lights have come on and you see, you might not see it all, but you're going to see a little piece, a little part. 
This is what you got to recognize to be the treasure in the field, the pearl, the great price, that which you're going to sacrifice everything else in order to make sure you apprehend who has apprehended you and you don't let that go. So for me, perhaps I'll give you an example for me to deny the reality of what I've seen in Jesus, the, what I feel has been a turning point or a conversion paradigm shift, a metanoia or repentance in my life of recent wasn't a repentance because of sin, because I have learned a long time ago that repenting in the sense of feeling bad or feeling sorry for something you've done doesn't change what you've done. It actually feels it because we have had a sin consciousness of sin itself. So we have to shift this around. Sin consciousness is moved out of the way and Christ consciousness comes into the forefront because it is never the examination of the counterfeit that gives us the ability to learn discernment. It is recognizing, understanding what is authentic when we handle that which is real, what is true, gives us the handle to say everything else is now counterfeit. And I have no desire, no desire whatsoever to give my life to something that brings forth nothing but the accolades of a man towards your achievements or your, what you feel you've arrived at. Ultimately, true humility is loving each other as we love ourselves as christ loves us changes everything matthew chapter 7 we read in verse 24 now we're gonna we're gonna take this a little bit slow just for a few moments because i want us to look at this contextually yeah one thing you'll learn about me is that i am a i am a stickler when it comes to people quoting bible out of context to try to create a proof text so that they can have some kind of um, argument for what they want to argue, even, even though most of the time their argument is not based upon the conviction of what Holy Spirit has revealed, rather it's based upon their need to be right or their need to just feel validated. Verse 24, therefore, and I'm in the New American Standard Bible. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Let's we'll stop right there. What words? What words of his is he speaking of? Well, he's speaking about all the ones you don't have underlined in your Bible. He's speaking about all those ones that we ignore. Because we feel it's just too hard to live up. But I want to tell you something. The New Testament of grace and truth is much more intense than the Old Testament and the Old Covenant laws and regulations. I've heard it said by some that the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus is the law of steroids. But watch this, not because it is to put you under a yoke of bondage as the law did, which was incapable of removing their sin. And watch this, because it was incapable of removing their sin, the law of the old covenant was incapable of justifying, restoring, and regenerating that which was diseased, lost, and alienated from the presence of God. Not that God was alienated from them, but beloved, if you're blind, deaf, and dumb in the truest of sense, you can have a hundred thousand people standing around you. And unless you have other, some other way of sensing maybe the vibration of them being near, you don't even know they're in your presence. Same with those who live a life full of sin and perhaps some form of agnosticism, not believing in God or believing that if there is one, there's no way we can know him. Because our attempts to know this God at the very best that we can do are futile. It is the, you know, here I am going, I'll, I'm going to quote some more church history. It is 
the heresy of Pelagianism. Pelagius was this dude who um, really began to write, and St. Augustine was the one who really was the one who began to counter what this man was teaching. Pelagianism was a teaching that we can get to Jesus without the blood, without the cross. He, you know, from my understanding, he did not teach or say that the blood and the cross of Jesus was unnecessary, only unnecessary for some people, that we weren't born into sin or born into a place that all sin and come short of the glory of God. Rather, sin is a propensity that we have, and then we can either sin or not sin, not understanding that when man sin on a, a submolecular level, deep inside of our entire genetic makeup in the core being of who we are, the essence of who we are, of a being that came out of non-being, of a creation that came out of non-existence, that God brought out of non-existence and out of non-being, he brings us into being, B-E-I-N-G, being, being, that means we are living, breathing, rational entities, humans, that at the very, the, the very deepest, the deepest place of our, of our being, was altered, diseased by sin to such an extent that it warped our perception of who God is, it warped what we perceived his image to be, and therefore it warped our perception and our image of ourself. And man outside of light walks in darkness, which is always a path of self-destruction. Why is the church all jacked up? Because we found a way that seems right to us. And we put Jesus on it. And we made money. Some of us, we, some, of, some people have made money off of false doctors. And so when light comes on, in order to be able to be right in him, we have to cease being right in ourselves. Which means we might have to renounce some things, apologize to some people, shut the doors of some ministries. But I promise you this, beloved, if you if you'll make that leap of faith, it's going to be worth it. So Matthew chapter six, we're looking here, verse twenty four. He says, "Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine again and acts on them, what words are we talking about? Well, if you just do a quick glance from Matthew chapter five forward, we're going to find out that Jesus is laying down." the laws of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so these are the laws that he inscribes in our hearts. These are the laws that come forth from a place of, of what we would say, yoking to him. So in other words, what we read here, and why I would say that in some ways is almost like the law of steroids, Jesus would say, you have heard it said that a man should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, in other words, you desire and you think about having sex with a person that doesn't belong to you, that's not your spouse. And when that happens, he says, you committed that already within the heart. You know, and the writers of the New Testament agree with this, as we will read that jealousy is hatred and hatred is murder, even if the action hasn't played out. Beloved, I don't say this to bring any form of condemnation, but to let you know that the things that came out out of the new covenant didn't come out of thin air there is what we call in the theological circles continuity and discontinuity of the old testament that means there are certain things that ceased ended are over with jesus fulfills the law and the prophets but there's continuity which means that even the new testament is not a new covenant it is a renewed covenant, which is the better way to say it. Let me explain why this is this is important. Because, and I've been in a lot of different camps. I'm going to tell you why this is a really important distinction. Watch this now. If you have an eschatology, the study of end times, the way you view what's going to happen at the end. You got some people that are the premillennial dispensationalists. They're waiting for the rapture. Why? Because they're in darkness and they and they, and they they just want light to come on in their lives and they don't know how to get us. They're waiting for the light to come from maybe another planet and then then one day we can see Jesus meet him in the air and then we can be with him. Not recognizing that the mystical union of Christ on the cross was understood throughout the entirety of church history as a vicarious union, a vicarious man. Jesus, the vicarious man, mystically unified all the human creation within him, not just the humans, but the entirety of the cosmos. 
every single living thing, every created thing that God made is included with him. Why? Because sin has affected not just the human, but the entire cosmos. Romans chapter 8, the earth groans, travailing as a woman in birth pangs, waiting for the revealing or manifestation of God's mature sons and daughters. So we see that at the very core essence, the subatomic um, the subatomic world, even in, when we go to the deepest understanding we got today of atoms and, and electrons and protons and, and quarks, string theory, all these different things, every single bit of it has been affected by sin. So when Jesus goes to the cross as the cosmic Christ, he is bringing everything that has been twisted and undone by Adam, and he's now undoing Adam himself so that in his resurrection, it is our resurrection because his death was our death. So in that resurrection, we have entered into the last L-A-S-T Adam. If that's true, if Jesus is the last Adam, as Paul says, we don't need to glance over that. We need to ask ourselves the harder questions and say, what does that mean? Well, Adam means man, human, mankind. If Jesus is the last Adam, how many come after last? Zero. So Jesus is the last Adam of the old creation, and he is the firstborn among a whole new creation, so that the entire human race at every flower that grows and every tree that buds forth, every star that shines in the night sky, every ocean wave, every dolphin, every jellyfish, every piece of seaweed, every piece of sand is in the life generating, beautiful Zoe life of Jesus, the son of God. Now, some people will take this and say, well, what are you saying, brother? Are you saying that everybody's saved? Everybody's going to have? No, that's not one of, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I wish it did. I do wish it did. And there are scriptures. I mean, the ultimate reconciliation, ultimate reconciliation guys, they're not pulling this out of thin air. Matter of fact, those who teach ultimate reconciliation have much more scriptural foundation than people preaching eternal conscious torment. Eternal conscious torment is a farce. It's, it, is, it is deeply embedded within Greek philosophy and Dante's Inferno during the medieval period. This is where a lot of this comes from. But what we do read, what we do find, when we carefully study hell and study what its purpose is and what it actually is and what the lake of fire actually is, what we're going to find out is that we all ultimately have a decision, decision and a choice. Do we bow our knee? And do we do it because the lights come on or do we continue to reject him who come to restore us back to his father? Because Jesus says in John 3, 16, that if they receive that they who believe in me shall not what perish. You can look it up for yourself, but that word perish means going into non-existent non-being so my personal conviction beloved is that if we don't if we don't somehow work it out and listen i'm not saying this to say your days are numbered i believe that god is much more merciful than we could ever comprehend his grace is continue extended he does not get upset when we fail to make mistakes he's actually the god who was long suffering and we know we got a lot of people say well god's mad and he's fixed out enough so he's coming to judgment they don't know god they're, they're coming from talking points. They're coming from um, it's regurgitated from what they've heard others say, and it fits more their personal biases and their personalities. But rather just understand that anything, beloved, that prophesies anything outside of Jesus is not prophecy. It's not. The Holy Spirit only talks about Jesus. When the spirit of truth comes, he will what? He will take all those things that are mine and give them to you, make them known to you. He doesn't speak on his own behalf. He speaks only concerning me. The spirit of truth, the beautiful, precious Holy Spirit, who is not a he or a she, but is identified as both in the, in, in the Old Testament text, especially, we see the feminine attributes of God working beautifully through the Holy Spirit in many, many, many ways. And the Holy Spirit is other-centered. This is the other-centeredness of God 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the other center love, not self center love. And the other center love and the Holy Spirit much prefers to work with people. The Holy Spirit loves to connect people. The Holy Spirit loves, watch it, loves to stand out of the way and allow someone else to shine if it's glorifying the Christ. The Holy Spirit, as C. Baxter Kruger would, um, would say, and I love what he says here, he calls the Holy Spirit the redeeming genius. The redeeming genius. The Holy Spirit can make something out of nothing, make a way where there is no way. The Holy Spirit always testifies of Jesus. So as we begin to wake up to the reality that Christ is in you, the hope of glory, it changes everything. And so we're not coming from a place of absence trying to keep the laws of God. We're coming from a place of presence moving into revelation and we don't have to think about how to keep the laws of God. We don't have to think about not stealing, not committing adultery, not committing idolatry. We don't have to think about coveting our neighbor. These things are no longer what we have to say or as the bare minimums of what we must do to enter or, or know eternal life. Rather, they are written, inscribed on our heart because it is in loving God with all your heart your soul and your mind loving your neighbor as yourself hinges the the two hinges on the door of the kingdom hinges all the law and the prophets so jesus comes to fulfill these things not say they were wrong he comes to complete them not say well these things are these things are the things that i never really truly intended but we gave them to you just for a time no they were tutors According to Paul in Galatians chapter four, Galatians three, they were chapter two. They were tutors. They were those who kept us or them at that time, kept them in an understanding of this is ultimately how our life should look. But the impossibility of doing it was because we had yet come into the faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, the faith, which is not the idea of believing, but the faith, which is the man, Jesus Christ. The faith is not just what we would want to refer to. It's a verb. It's something that that's, well, I have no problem saying faith is a verb as well as a noun, because ultimately when you begin to study the words in some of the original language, you're going to find out through the entirety of the Old Testament, God it's not defined by a name that can be uttered in a human tongue. That's why even the word that we come to know as Yahweh was a four, four Hebrew letters that had to be said into lettering. They did not, it did not form a name like we would know to articulate. Why? Because God says, I'm not letting you put me in a box. If you can name me, you can handle me. If you can handle me, you can dismiss me. But I'm not going to allow you to do that. So I'm not going to allow you to put me in a box because you think you've got a monopoly or you have the capital on what it is to know God. Rather, he says, I will reveal who I am in the fullness of time through the God man, Jesus Christ, the name above every name, Yeshua, which is a name that actually means Yahweh is salvation and so that at the name of yeshua every knee bows and every tongue will ultimately spread their allegiance let me move on i'm i'm rambling i feel like what i'm saying is important but i want to get to this right here so what jesus is saying if you're going to hear my words and act on them this is what you got to do what words well let's look contextually at what jesus was saying prior when you just take a a quick read through Matthew 5, you're going to find the Beatitudes. You're going to find that within all of this, we're going to find blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. We're going to find blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. They receive mercy. Not the judgmental. Blessed are the merciful. We're going to find out that there's a blessedness from the peacemakers. They're the sons of God, the pure in heart, and they shall see God. All you know, we got these blessings, then we get into what it means to be disciples in the cosmos. You're the salt, you're the light. 
of the world. You're a city set on a hill. It cannot be hid. You begin to continue to read about um, <clears throat> what real righteousness is, prayer and fasting. You begin to realize that the ultimate expression of a life that is anchored in our relationship with Jesus looks like loving your neighbor. So Jesus says, these are the words of mine. And if you hear them and act on them, let me tell you who you're like. <clears throat> you're going to be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. No, I want to stop right there because Luke's gospel says something a little bit differently. Luke says it in a way that, um, let me turn there, Luke chapter 6, 47. And read it to you from here on out because we get a little more of the description of what's going on in order to build on rock. And Luke 7, around verses, I think 47 or so, says, Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe Luke chapter 6. Yes, Luke 6, 46. Now, this is what we read Why do you call me Lord? Lord, I do not do what I say. What does this mean, Lord, Lord? This is interesting. He's not saying Adonai, Adonai. This, the, we only have this one Greek word for the word Lord. But what we're seeing here is, why do you call me Yahweh Adonai? In other words, you, you are calling me the name of God. And you don't do what I say. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? Well, number one, we don't even realize that he is God half the time. We, we give lip service to it, but we've not really studied or given ourselves to understand what does it mean to say Jesus is Lord? Remember what I said, for those who are still listening who has heard me before, I have said something along the lines of this. The question you need to ask yourself that will, will, will catapult you into what is known as Hearing God, learning of God, knowing God, your path to wholeness, your path to healing, your path to union with him. It's the question, who is Jesus Christ? Who is he really? So we got to learn to study that out. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, you hear and then you put to action what you heard. Faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing what? The Logos, the word of God. So action becomes the, the movement from within his body from hearing what's being said. So we act on what we hear. We don't just brush it off. Why? Because down the road, it's going to be devastating. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who hears, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house. All right, listen. We're trying to build a house. Perhaps this is a prophetic picture of Jesus showing us that throughout the history of Christianity, we're going to see what looks like two specific kingdoms that are diametrically opposed one to another i'm not referring to satan's kingdom and god's kingdom i'm referring to two different people groups or two different ideals that build in the name of jesus but yet their building is fundamentally different in its in its in its or is in its origin what do we read here I'm going to like him to a man who built a house. He's building a house. So what did he do? He dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. First thing I want you to look at, beloved, number one, number one here, they didn't build the rock. They did not lay the foundation. They did not build a foundation. This is a misconception that I want to go ahead and try to bring a little bit of light to you. Because when we read in Ephesians chapter 2, 20, that he built his church upon the foundation of of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, we must recognize that the foundation of is only because they are of the foundation. 
They did not build the foundation. It's a foundation of, in other words, it is the foundation that's built upon the one in whom they discovered when they dug deep. Hmm. Dig deep into what? Church history? No. You, you know, you, you, that, yes, maybe, but not, not necessarily. Not at first. Digging deep means the mystery that's been hidden for ages that's now revealed Christ in you, beloved. I don't care if you're a Muslim or a Buddhist or, you know, in today's world, homosexual, drug addict, prostitute. You have to dig deep because watch this, beloved. You're not going to find Jesus when you clean yourself up. You're going to find Jesus when you dig to the bottom of the trash can. And when you get to the very bottom of the trash, there you find Jesus. I'm going to say that you got to get this because I'm trying to bring hope for those who are still wearing the mask of the pretender. Put your smile on your face. Hallelujah. Bless and highly favored. And realize that God's not afraid of your mess. Jesus According to St. John's Gospel, John chapter 1 and verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word flesh here is the Greek word sarx. This is important because you could be looking at two different ideas here. You could be looking at the Greek word sarx. You could be looking at the Greek word anthropos. Anthropos means humanity. Sarx means sinful human nature. Now, Jesus never committed a sin, but yet he came in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he was tempted in always just like all of us, yet without sin. Jesus comes into the midst of our darkness. Jesus is born incarnation, comes right into the midst of our despondency, our alienation, our the lies, the, the delusion, the matrix that we have believed to be the reality that is really not a reality, but a false reality that's been painted over the canvas of God's beautiful and good creation. You know, today you'll see movies that if you can just move it all back, brother, you're going to see this warfare going on. And all of this is burning and fire and smoke, even though it may look pretty right now. I, I call BS to that because the warfare that happens now by princes, powers, dominions, authorities are only empowered by the agreement that man gives them because they have already fundamentally and permanently, definitively been defeated by the cross of Yeshua. So the cross was what spoiled principalities and powers, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in his cross. The enemy has been defeated permanently. What he is now is a whisper of lies and deceit to try to keep us in a place of perceived alienation, perceived blindness, so that we can't see him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the enemy is a defeated enemy. Warfare must come from a place of coming out of agreement with the lie. This is even Luke 10. Luke 10, Jesus sends to the disciples, 70 of them, two by two to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. They come back to Jesus with a good report, and they say this, Lord, even demons are subject to us through your name. Jesus says, don't rejoice in this. Now, we know the part that says, rather rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But he doesn't stop there. He says this to Jesus says this, I beheld Satan, Satan, the Satan, fall from heaven as lightning. We think that this is something that happened pre-Adam. That's Gnosticism. This is speculations and vain philosophies that have no substance of the overarching theme or narrative of Jesus and what he's doing. Beloved, Jesus is not a footnote. Jesus is the depth of God's love that cannot be exhausted. It's eternal. There is, and you will never exhaust the depth, the breadth, the length, and the height of God's love, which is in Christ. So you can, you, you'll never get bored is what I'm trying to say. But see, when we begin to try to pin this into some other time frame before, um, before we um, have been given, really have been given the light of what happened in Satan's fall. There are scriptures. There are other books. There are things. I've studied them. I believe there may be some validity to, that, to it, but we have to learn how to interpret those things as well. So we got to be careful. 
when we move beyond any extra biblical reference of what happened with spiritual warfare, demons, angelology, things like that. Um, you know, I, I wrote a book that I've never published about 150, 160 pages on demons and angels. So I, I've done my studies on this. But let me say it this way. When they went into this campaign to preach the gospel, they were not told to set up prayer centers where they could pray around the clock until Rome fell and until um, Judaism fell. The gospel was not set up to be some form of hideaway defense. Rather, it is a polemic war, which is, means that there is a word that is nigh thee, even in your mouth. You've been called to be a, watch this, a body or a prophethood of all believers. Not that every one of you is a prophet, but rather because you are in the prophet, the Doma Grace gift, the prophet, Jesus Christ. We all have the ability, and I'll say it even further, take it a step further. We all have the commandment to hear what he says and act on them, which makes us prophetic people within the space called time and dimensions so that we are words of God sent into the four corners of the earth that speak in a way that brings forth illumination or enlightenment or light, photon. So when we see that Jesus sends the 70, they come back, they rejoice. It's not because they entered into third heaven level spiritual warfare, putting on their armor and then saying, um, praying and fasting and declaring and shouting at, at the heavens. John Paul Jackson wrote a book called Needless Casualties of War, where he talks about men in the spiritual warfare movement are throwing hatchets at the moon, trying to hit it. We don't have the ability to hit the moon with a hatchet, nor could we do it with a rifle. It's not The bullet's not going to travel that far. What we do in order to dethrone what is present in our nations, in our communities, in our regions in spiritual warfare does not come based upon our ability to scream at them or to rebuke them. Michael dare not bring a rallying accusation against Satan when contending with him over the body of Moses, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. What's going on here? There is a paradigm shift. How do I engage in spiritual warfare? By being obedient to what I've been called to do. Because when they went into the cities and regions preaching metanoia, repentance, and started healing the sick and casting out demons, Jesus' response to that was, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. In other words, that which was set up in that region that held it in its grip and its power falls when the region comes out of agreement with the prince of darkness. So what dethrones principalities and powers is when the lights come on within a person and they come out of agreement with the darkness they once walked with because two cannot walk together lest they be agreed. Satan, demons, lust, addiction, these things cannot walk with you unless there's part of you that still agrees with something in the kingdom of darkness. This is why Jesus would say the prince of this world is coming, but he doesn't have nothing in me. What he's saying is that I'm about to be tested and tried, but listen, there's nothing to worry about because there's not anything in me at all that agrees with him. So it's like him talking to a wall. So temptation no longer becomes tempting. Accusation no longer sounds like the word of God. Party line, profiling politics no longer is being uttered out of our mouth by a spirit of delusion because we have found that the Christ in us is a sure word of prophecy, a more sure word of prophecy that is actually the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of the prophecy. So now we begin to come from a place of inside out evangelism. We're not trying to, we're not going to set up and say, well, we're going to pray over the city for 40 days and 40 nights. Then we're going to start the mission. Like that's going to change anything. Not recognizing greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The reason why we think we have to do things like this is because we're coming about 
the entire strategy from an inverted Old Testament discontinuation, remember continuity, discontinuity, a discontinuity of the Old Testament that we find in references like Daniel chapter, what, seven, somewhere around there, where Daniel says the Prince of Persia, um, um, Daniel prays 21 day fast. Finally, Gabriel comes and says, um, the moment you prayed, you were heard, but I was contending with the Prince of Persia. Uh, Michael, the Prince comes and he takes the battle on. So I'm able to come and give you this message. Beloved, that's the discontinuity, not recognizing the cross once again as the definitive benchmark in creation. We look for the, the final appearing, the last coming, second coming, whatever you like to coin it, as when he's going to make all these things right. We missed it. We have bought into the, the whispering snake of the serpentine wisdom, and we're still trying to earn our salvation, and we still think that if we scream, shout, and we got all this power in order to do all these things, not recognizing the only power to deal with darkness is when the lights come on, and the lights don't come on because we say it to the sky. The lights come on when the message is ingrained in our heart, and when we say it, people are converted. So as men and women who are the light of the world are converted and the light in their eye becomes single, then principalities of powers don't have power anymore because they cannot operate in the realm of light. So the problem today that is in the nations is not spiritual warfare. The problem is the absence of light because when light comes on, darkness no longer has any ability to hold any single individual. Darkness cannot wrestle with light, period. Any wrestling we find ourselves is based because of the paradox of us in the sense of the human fallen essence that happened in Adam, yet we are born again through the vicarious man, Jesus Christ, a whole new creation. We are still born with the contingency of what sin is in our life. Therefore, there has to still be a conversion so that we are baptized into Christ or into the second man, last Adam, second man. We are now coming on our way out of darkness into light. Every single last individual on the planet, their purpose is to worship, to bow their knee, to confess with their mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't do it because we have a convincing argument. They will do it only because somebody is able to turn the lights on. And when they see for themselves, then they convert all by themselves by way of the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? So these are my words. If you listen to my words, this is what Jesus is saying. Don't call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what I say. Stop it. Quit calling yourself an apostle. Quit calling yourself a prophet. You're embarrassing yourself because you cannot do these things and call him Lord if you have no interest in what he's told you to do to begin with. You say, well, my calling is different. No, it's not different. It's the same calling that may entail a different level of operations based upon the unique expression of the God image that's in you, because you and I are all the image of God in the earth. We are not to begin to conform ourselves to each other, to look like each other. Spiritual fathers are not to try to make sons in their image. Spiritual fathers cannot be spiritual fathers if they are steep within their roots go deep down around the rocks of their self-righteousness and their need to be validated this is narcissism that is quickly approaching the level of high level strategic warfare because they have given into the wrong spirit the moment that we accuse one another it is the breath of the satan it is only in the place of intercession that we take on the righteous acts of God in Christ Jesus. So Jesus doesn't walk around accusing people in lack in the limited knowledge or their limited light. Rather, we begin to look for the God in them so that if I can see the area of blessed assurance operating in your life, even though you're unaware of it, I move through the dirt, I move through the darkness to discover the light that's in them so that we can begin to move everything away from what is holding them, keeping them from having the vision of God. Remember, Jesus is in the depths of your garbage waiting for you to discover him. 
This is what, uh, this isn't me, beloved. This is Jesus in the core essence of all things that he holds together, all things made by him and through him and for him, and nothing has its being outside of him. He holds and contains all things together by the power of his word, and all things consistent have their being in him. So when we read here in Luke chapter 6, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep digging through the depths of the dirt what is dirt earth what are you made of earth you are the earth that god is saying dig out dig out all the roots of bitterness you know root dig it out you know i i, I begin to see in me what i saw in um a man by the name of um a, a short name mac in 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 the book the shack when he, the Holy Spirit is in the garden of his heart and it's all chaotic, but beautiful. And they're digging. And then there's this root. The Holy Spirit says, don't touch that. It's deadly. The root of bitterness was exposed. We have to get through the root systems of our misconceptions, the root systems through our abuse that we have endured as children. We have to allow, we have to allow the word of God to come to you, not as much like a sword and a spear, but the word of the Lord to come to you in the form of a plowshare and a pruning hook so that you can uncover the pearl of great price, not in another man's field, but in this field of your own living, beating heart. There you'll discover your creator, not out there, not in some far removed heaven, but he has come near you. He is near you, even in your mouth, he says to his prophets. Emmanuel, God with us. He has come into Sark's, the sinful condition, made himself flesh right in the midst of our trash heap, right in the midst of our delusion, right in the middle of our perceived alienation, separation. And there he is saying, will you hear my voice? So our job, beloved, is to help men and women discover the potential that God's placed within them, but that can only happen by helping them discover the God in them. This is the gospel. I think spiritually I can hear crickets chirping around some people, but cricket, chirp, chirp, chirp. What does he say? You got to dig deep. Why? Because only there do you find the rock. Watch this. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the what? Rock. So the foundation laid is not the rock. The foundation laid is on the rock. Who's the rock? It's not Dwayne Johnson. Can you smell what the rock is cooking? No, the rock is the son of God. The eternal Logos. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. The Logos, the word of God, which is Jesus. The word of God is the oak of God planted in the force of eternity, entwining its roots around the rock of ages. Very poetic. So if he dug deep, he removes all of the shifting substance of the limited, the limited self knowing that it's not by works lest any man should boast, it is the gift of God. So the gift of God is established. The works that we're looking at here is the rediscovery of the God nature in you. That is not just an energy like the new age would lead you to believe, but he is a person that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. So you are digging to the bottom of your trash heap, your hurts, your insecurities, your, your, your tendencies to be in control, your tendencies to, to, to go a certain way, to go astray, to do things your way. God is after that. He's after all of that because only when you are able to remove all of the stuff do you find him looking back at you in the depths of the deepest place of yourself that you say, I was, I, was, I was never alone. There you were the whole time. It's kind of like um, Alice in the Wonderland in a way. You know, the rabbit hole that was dug out eventually goes into a whole nother plane of existence and living. 
so that it was in him I was living. It was in him I was moving. It was in him I was having my being. So now he builds a house because he laid foundation on the rock, which is Jesus. So when a flood occurred, the torrent, which is like hurricane winds, they burst against the house and it could not shake it. God is wanting to raise up sons and daughters that cannot be shaken by what's going on around them. Love your path to wholeness starts here. As long as, uh, listen, I'm not there yet. I'm on a journey. I'm closer than I've ever been. I've experienced this peace that passes my understanding. I've laid hold of it, but it's a daily laying hold of. And if I get sidetracked, I can quickly, easily settle for the memory of yesterday's bread, yesterday's presence, not recognizing that it's not yesterday's presence or yesterday's bread I need. It's the daily bread I need that keeps me consistent in living in a place where the foundation is stable and the house can't be shaken. See, it's not just an unshakable foundation, beloved. It's an unshakable house when it is built upon that foundation. We think that we're all on this one foundation, and when the wind and the rain comes, everything that's not kingdom is shaken off of it. Well, you know, there's an existence that's, that, that's, that's scriptural, but what we're looking at is more to it than just that. So what we're going to look at here then is that when the wind, when the wind, wind, rain, listen, when you got peace in your heart, you'll not be moved by the unpeace around you. When you have uh, come to know him in a way that has brought forth wholeness and healing to the deep woundings that we all have, we've all experienced. And some of these woundings, there's, they, they may be a scar. They may be a thorn in your flesh. It may be things that daily you're going to have to allow the Lord to breathe upon so that you don't fall back into whatever form of feeling that ultimately becomes idol worship in your life. If beloved, unforgiveness is idolatry in one of the, one of the highest ways. Why? Because you cannot worship the Lord your God if you are bound to the negative event of your life that happened with somebody else. So unforgiveness, watch this, unforgiveness in its very core essence is you being yoked to somebody else's memory and not yoked to the living daily presence that you receive through the daily bread of the presence of Abba Father. So why does he say forgive so that you can be forgiven? Because you cannot be forgiven if you don't forgive. Not because he hasn't already forgiven you, but you can't receive forgiveness. You can't believe him to forgive you. Why? Because your perception is going to be on him in the same way as on yourself and others. It's, this is what it means to see him is to see him as he is and you become like him. So it's. So it's, it's just like this. If, if I refuse to forgive, then I have refused to let go. And if I refuse to let go, I can't attain or apprehend the one who's apprehended me. So he's already apprehended you. He's already laid hold of you. But you've got to return the embrace. And you can't return the embrace until you learn to dig a little bit deeper into the depths of who you are. This is why we cannot just say psychology has no place in the Christian church. I have no idea what it means to study in-depth psychology at all, other than the fact that I know that my life has been a big hot mess and that it has taken me becoming blatantly honest with myself in order for him to be able to say, son, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not disappointed in you. I just want to help you through this. I want to walk with you. I want to work with you through the process of your wholeness. If you mess up, it doesn't change the way I feel about you. But it's the only way, beloved, you're not going to be able to make it is if you just flip and quit altogether and harden your heart. Put the dirt back over the foundation and say, I'm not building on this rock. I'm afraid of this rock. I'm going to hide this rock and I'm going to hide from this rock. I don't want to see it. We got people today with their fingers in their ears running around blah, 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 because they don't want to hear it's the reason why when we go to sleep at night we put on white noise it's the reason why we not put on music it's the reason why we prefer teaching and preaching over 
contemplative silence because it's in the place of silence that God's voice comes forth. This is Elijah after being under the spell, the witchcraft of Jezebel goes into the Mount of Horeb. And it's there that the wind comes, the fire burns, the ground shakes, but God was not in the fire. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the wind even though it paralleled what we saw with Moses when he goes into the cloud of unknowing in the book of Exodus because the enemy can mimic a past move of God in order to keep you from moving forward in his ongoing ministry and work in the earth your earth watch this so if the enemy can mimic what God has done he can't do what God's done but he can mimic and if he can mimic, we have to have the ability to discern God's voice from the center of it. Watch this, because even though with Moses, there was fire, there was the ground shaking, there was the earthquake, there was, um, there was the wind blowing, there was the, the, I mean, it was an all out dark, unknowing cloud, darkness, not in the sense of ignorance, but darkness in the sense of human reasoning, which is actually the light that we can't perceive with our eye. But before Moses Take, took one step into the mountain. He waited for six days. Six is the number of man, beloved. We must come to the end of ourself until or in order to hear the voice deep inside saying, come. Moses did not enter the cloud until he heard the still small voice. Hello, Elijah. God was not in the, the storm. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire, not in the wind. The three elements of the ancient Pharaonician, how do you say that word? What Jezebel was, the three elements of their witchcraft. It wasn't the five-star pentagram. It was a threefold elemental reality of what they worked and practiced in their source, well, not sorcery, but in their actual incantations and spellcasting. Elijah had to know just because Moses had it this way, I have to hear to know that the still small voice is telling me this is me or it's not me. Because we get so enthralled by what's going on that we say, God's glory, God's glory, God's glory. But yet nobody has yet to hear him say, Linda, Linda. You have to hear him whisper your name in the midst of all the hell you're going through. It was Elijah that wrapped himself up within the mantle of his purpose in the midst of the hell going on around him that he was able to hear the still small voice because it's there and then that God recommissions the discouraged, the, 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 the depressed, and even suicidal prophet. Suicide is broke off the back of Elijah the moment that his purpose has been redefined and he has received a recommissioning. The true sense of the spirit of, watch this, the true power, the root to suicide, the root to it is not feeling like you have a purpose. Let me, let me share this story with you. Now, this is a secular man who's doing great things. As far as I know, he doesn't know who Jesus is. His name's Tony Robbins. A motivational speaker who really seeks to help people, though. He does more to help people than most people in the church, sadly. Let me tell you what happened. I watched his documentary on him a couple years ago, and he was teaching and instructing and doing his thing. And the dude starts moving in words of knowledge. It's, it's a weird thing. It's, it's like, it's, you know, some people will say, well, that's a counter. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. The man may not know Jesus, and he needs to know Jesus. It's expedient. It does not mean that God is not using his life to help others. And there was, a, there was a, a lady, young lady that stood up, and she began to tell her testimony, her story, that she had come from another country where her entire family was, in, was sex slaves. They were raped, they were tortured, and her younger daughters, I mean, younger sisters or whatever it was, in order to keep them protected, she gave herself, and she was abused, and she was, it, 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 she was, and everybody felt she was a strong one in her family, and they looked at her, but she told Tony, she said, I'm about to end it, I'm going to kill myself, I can't do this anymore, I'm weak, this is my last, this is the last straw, this is, all I know is that if I'm going to get any, if anything's going to happen, if I want to get any level of breakthrough, it's got to happen now. And I told my wife, Lisa, we were watching it together. I said, this, this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road. 
Let's see what happens. And you know what he did? Begins to speak into her life, her strengths, her the positive things. But he doesn't stop there. He then says, you're going, this is what he said to her. He said, you're going to do what I do, only you're going to do it far better. As a matter of fact, my entire team is going, I'm going to get you signed up. It's not going to cost you anything. I'm going to relocate you. I'm going to pay for everything. And you're going to take the however many three-year training. It's all paid for. And you're going to do what I do. You know what it did? It broke. It broke suicide off of her completely. Why? Because all she thought was, I've never been anything. I've been a, a, a tool for others to use. I've been abused and I can't handle it no more. The moment that she was commissioned into something that was that took her out of self-centered focus into other centered focus was the moment that suicide melted off of her and lost its grip entirely. Elijah the, Elijah, the suicidal prophet, no longer is suicidal. Why? Because he has been recommissioned and he's been given a purpose. You give a man a purpose. Now, you know, you've heard it said, I've been like, I think I'm Catholic here. <laughs> but you heard it said like this, this whole idea is kind of like this right here. If you, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, you teach a man a fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Let me add this. If you give a man a purpose, he will discover the seven seas. It's not just about providing for your family. It's about the ongoing purpose of Christ in you and the reason why people are wandering around in darkness the reason why people just think they got to be called uh, i'm apostle i'm prophet I'm, listen law of law of existing order this is where we're at this is what we're coming out of i understand it but we can't afford to remain in a place of self-centered self-seeking because the love of god that shed abroad in our heart by the holy ghost is not a self-centered self-seeking love it's an other centered other seeking love and it is a love that as it pours out to us, it never knows any form or any, in any way does it ever, ever decrease. But it is an eternal love, like a river that never decreases as it pours out. It always stays full. The more he pours out, he still stays full, complete. And that's the love of God. That is shed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's the love of God that we've been commissioned with to go into the places of the darkness and allow them to see the light. But to do this, we have to become so honest with ourselves. You know, when you start digging deep into your own psyche and to the three levels of the noose, N-O-U-S, or the, the human consciousness, and then we learn that that is not the cap, you know, that the, the whole idea of Hindu religion is that the chakras ultimately start from the tip or the base of the spinal cord and move up all the way up into the crown chakra the crown chakra is not the ultimate place of illumination these guys don't take it far enough it is at the end of the noose the the, the divine place of meeting to reason with god that you go into a whole new way of communication and thinking of what we would call intellectual spiritual understanding this happens only when now the mind which is the place of the skull the place where the cross of christ made the definitive stand against darkness happens and it's at the place of the skull that the mind is crucified so that in prayer we bring our head to the earth of which it derives its wisdom, the serpentine wisdom that moves on its belly through the dust, eating the death, the dust of man all of his days. And the heart, which is around 18 inches below the mind, becomes the elevated seat of spiritual consciousness so that now it's not what we think and reason that determines our actions and our faith, but we have learned how to go into Abba's secret chamber, which is an eternal depth, breadth, length, height of God's love that cannot be exhausted. So it's through the heart that we've entered back into the Eden of God that was lost through sin, but has been restored through the last Adam. In the finality of the definitive action against darkness, against death, against Satan, against demons, against all of the things that we see still going on in the world today, 
And we have now entered into a place where now we don't see it the way the premillennial dispensationalists make us think it, that this is Satan's earth. Demons are running ramshod over everybody. What we now see when the curtain shall pull back, we, according to scriptures, are told this, that we, when we see him, we're going to be amazed, not God. When we see who Satan is, we're going to be amazed that something like that was ever able to deceive us and to keep us in bondage because Satan has been defeated. The only power that Satan has is the agreement that we give him it's like feeding the serpent in genesis 3 and revelation chapter 19 chapter 17 i believe we end up with a dragon so it's somewhere between the serpent of genesis 3 and the dragon of the book of revelation someone has fed that thing so what we have to do is starve the enemy from the dust that we are made from so that now the agreement of our soul our mind our heart we love god with our hearts our soul, our minds, it destroys the works of the demonic and the satanic, which are different. It destroys the works of the satanic and the demonic from our hearts, from our souls, and from our minds, so that the mind in us now becomes the mind of Christ, and the mind is no longer filtering what we speak but the mind is now being filtered through the heart. So now what we speak are words of truth and words of life. So that when we tell a demon to come out, it doesn't argue with us because why we have first understood that I don't even dare come in my authority. I have no authority. I don't have no power. You know, we got men saying, oh, I got authority, but I got more. No, listen, you know, I did that stuff too. It's just not true though. It's not true. The authority and power that we have is an authority and power that cannot be exhausted, but is only through the recognition that all authority and power is in Christ and I'm in him. So then any authority and power that I operate in does not come from my authority, comes from his authority. The power that flows through me doesn't come from my power, comes through his power. So now again, I'm hitting God in Christ Jesus. So I put him on according to Galatians chapter three, verse 26, 27, 28, 29. And that's what we read. What we read now is that if we are baptized into Christ, we put Christ on. There's neither bond nor free. Jew or Greek, male or female, we're one in Christ Jesus. And if we be Christ, we're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promises. The promises. So now we do enter into an authority and power greater than anything we've ever experienced in our life. Not because we think we can, we can conjure it up. We don't conjure. We yield. And we think. And we see. We think through his thinking. We see through his singing. We hear through his hearing. This is what Jesus showed us. I don't do anything but what I see my father do. I don't say anything but what I hear my father say. When this begins to happen, even at a, at a, at a sprout level, you know, take an take a oak tree, a mighty, take a mighty uh, redwood. The very, very... The very what? What do we call that? The, the photosynthesis when the, the the germination and now the seed is going to um bust the little little green sprout's going to come out of the seed, break through it. The it, it doesn't look anything like the seed, but in the seed always contain the full DNA of what it wanted it to be. Unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it goes to the ground and dies, it brings forth what much fruit. So what we are now does not even yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. So we're going to begin to grow that even at the very little place of growth is enough to have all authority and power over all the satanic and demonic in the world. It doesn't take the full grown tree. It just takes the realization that I'm breathing Christological air and anything that's trying to breathe on me that does not have the breath of God is breathing on me illegally. Yeah, yeah. This has changed my life, guys. Everything I thought I was trying to get done for the kingdom of God. After, listen, ups and downs, you know, a little over 20 years of ministry, I found myself in the early parts of December of this past year, just a month ago, seeking God. And I saw a glimpse of him, a beatific vision. And everything that I had taught just got turned inside out. 
it inverted everything. It, the message didn't change. What changed is the way I saw the message. The way you didn't change, the way I saw you changed. And that change, beloved, is the light that shines brighter and brighter into the perfect day. Let me try to bring this to a land this airplane here. It's this whole thing, man, verse 48 of Luke 6, he dug deep. A man is building a house, but he dug deep. He laid a foundation on the rock, which is not something he made or he created. He dug deep enough until he found the one who would sustain him and hold him and carry him through life. When you dig to the depths of your garbage, you'll, if you keep digging, you got to keep digging. It's hard. You got you to confront some stuff to dig this deep. You're going to have to confront those ugly sides of you that you have suppressed all of your life and you don't want to do it. But it's only when you dig deep and you get to the bottom of your trash pile do you see Jesus. There he is. He said, now. Let's build now what we build will not be moved by the wind, the rain or the wind. What we build now will be an unshakable house because you are now building on an unmovable eternal foundation. And that foundation has a name. His name is Jesus in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead in human body. But if you don't do it the right way, but well, the one who heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house. This is why I said, fool, the, this is this message, fools and sages. The, the dream on by Aerosmith, you know, live and learn through fools and through sages. The past is gone. So, I, yeah, I like that song. Anyway, he's building, but he's not building like he should. Why? Because he's not digging. He says, ah, I'm good. I've been doing fine. I've suppressed it all for years. But God's called me. So let's just start building today. And then some of us who, who wonder why some people seemingly rise so fast in ministry, only to fade away. Jason Upton wrote a song in the earlier two, early 2000s, I think the first decade of the 2000s, called Dying Star. Beautiful prophetic song that had some of the most powerful ministers of that time pulling, heard it, hearing for the first time they heard it, pulled their vehicles off the road to go lay in a ditch and weep. Some people got offended because they said, you're talking about me. And Jason said, this song's not about you. This song was about me. I was the one full of pride. I was the star that was shining so bright that nobody could see Jesus. All they could see was me. So we can go ahead and build the house. We can pattern the house just like those apostles. We can pattern the house according to an Orthodox church. We can pattern the house according to the Pentecostal denomination down the road. It will not stand the test of trials and time. It may last a little while, but it will fade and it will disappear. It will come from non-being and it will enter, as Athanasius will say, into non-being. Why? Because only that which has been built on the rock will stand the winds, the tests, the storms of life. But watch this. That means at the very core of the foundation, we must be raw, raw with ourselves. We have to be raw with ourselves say, Lord. Only you can help me uncover. How do you do this? First of all, blood, it's going to take a paradigm shift. It's going to take repentance because you're going to have to have a paradigm shift from this spiritual warfare motif to understand that real warfare is not by the sword and the shield, but real warfare is by, this, by, the, by the plow and the pruning hook. Micah 4 or Isaiah 4, Micah 2, or either that is... Isaiah 2, Micah 4, same prophecy. They beat their swords into pruning hooks. They beat their spears into pruning hooks. They beat their swords into plowshares. So we start uncovering. Because if we don't, there will be no stability in it. Because even if we got the right praise and worship, we got the right children's program, even though we got, we could put a Starbucks 
in the foyer. You know, all of this stuff is, is a model that is not based upon what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. But what we're doing is we're comparing ourselves by others. And we've entered into this game of competition. I don't say it's not true. When's the last time you shut down your ministry on Sunday to go hang out with another church? This is not the gospel. It's far from it. This is a glorified, I would say social club at one time. It is to an extent, but more than a social club, it's a glorified LARPs meeting. It's live action role playing. We get in character. We put on our costumes. We got our little names that we have because we're the ministers. And we gather together and we pretend like we're doing something. And then we want everybody to believe that we actually are accomplishing something just because you had enough ties come in that you're able to give a few cans of soup to somebody last week. Hmm. Good. As long as you sleep better at night. That's all that matters. That's not the gospel. The gospel is to look at somebody else and say they don't know. Therefore, what can I do to help them know they need the light on? We don't have churches and denominations. It's a false paradigm created. Really, it's been created and twisted, manipulated under the biases and the uh, agenda of men who were corrupt, corrupt kings, corrupt priesthoods. The church is the ecclesia. The ecclesia is a Hebrew word, kahal. So when you hear somebody teach that the church Greek word ecclesia is actually this um, idea that Jesus had from looking at the Roman Greco ecclesia of his day, that's, that is not the truth. The word ecclesia is the transliteration in the Septuagint of the Hebrew word kahal. Kahal was the only other congregation or fellowship that ever existed that belonged to god prior to the new testament and the only other person ever had a church was moses so jesus says that i will build my kahal my ecclesia my holy nation my congregation my fellowship my family and the gates of hell will not prevail against them the way they did against the one in the wilderness because you can look it up kahal Transliteration is ecclesia. The Greek Septuagint, which is the Old Testament written in the Greek language, you will see every time the word kahal is present, it will be the word ecclesia. It is the word in the Old Testament translated into the Greek to refer to the congregation of Moses. And God is looking for a family, a communion, men and women that know who they are so they can sit down at the table of God, not the pulpit of God. This is at the table where discipleship happens. And discipleship doesn't look like you looking like me. Discipleship looks like you looking like Jesus. So if we don't do what is necessary or allow the deep work of the Holy Spirit and the men and women of God that's been put into your life to help you, then what we build is not going to last Sadly, most people could care less because they think they're getting out of here on a bus in a few minutes anyway, because they're, they, once again, the moment we start from a place of absence, we're always trying to get to a place of presence. So therefore, we will invent doctrines that will get us to heaven in such a way to keep us from having to have to go through the process of self-discovery so that we can discover him. Because it's only as we see him do we see ourselves. So in other words, it's only when you can name him by revelation will he name you by revelation. Who do men say that I am? You're this person. You're a prophet. You're John the Baptist. You're Elijah. You're Jeremiah. You're one of those prophets. We today are in a phenomenal spectacle of parroting what others say we can say who jesus is by what others say about jesus but until that revelation that testimony that witness that comes that rolls off your tongue is sourced only by divine revelation that comes from the father because it's the father that reveals the son and it's the son who reveals the father each does so by the holy spirit it's only when we're able to say, you are the Christ, Benaha Elohim. You are Mashiach. Yeshua Mashiach, Benaha Elohim. This is what he said. It's what Peter said. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Translated. What is he saying? 
He's saying, I see you. I can see, I see you. I, I see you. Jesus says, I see you too. And Peter or Simon, I tell you, Simon, I'm going to change your name because Simon holds within it the idea of a reed that's shaken back and forth in the wind. But I say to you, you are Petra, Peter. And I will build upon this revelation, my kingdom, my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What rock? The rock that's discovered from digging deep. I build upon this. And here it is. The moment that Simon bar Jonah was able to say, you are the Christ, the son of God, the Christ, the son of God, will turn to Simon and say, and you're Peter. The moment you can see him and say his name by the spirit, no man calls Jesus Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Hello, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. What does that mean? Does it mean Adonai? Does it mean call Jesus master? No. Lord here does not mean what we, it does not hold the idea that he is just Adonai. Like we see um, Psalms 110, for example, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What we're looking at here is two words. Adonai, Yahweh says to Adonai. When we say no one calls Jesus Lord, but by the Holy Spirit, we're saying no one can call Jesus Yahweh, but by the Holy Spirit. This is not oneness. This is not moving into a oneness monotheistic teaching. This is saying this. This is saying that Jesus name means Yahweh is salvation. So you cannot know him or see him as eternally begotten of God, God of very God. True God of true God, true light of true light, but by the Holy Spirit. So the proclamation of who he is becomes the proclamation of who you are. And when you know him, you'll know yourself. When you love him, you love yourself. And if you love yourself the way you're supposed to by loving him, you will love your neighbors. I'm not going to go any further into this today. I'll pick back up on another time, but um, um I think um, we can pray and we can um, we can talk a few moments if you want to, or if anybody else has anything else to share, that would be that would be fine too. So let me just pray for the people watching real quick, and then we'll see what God wants to do. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the beautiful, matchless name of King Jesus. Lord, I acknowledge you are God, and you're a man, ontologically one, and in you, all the cosmos has its being. Without you, nothing has any being that has being. I acknowledge, I confess with my mouth, not just for myself, but for those who hear me, that if you could be removed from the equation of any existing thing, even for a moment, that existing thing would no longer exist. You hold all things together by the power of your word, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. You are the savior of humanity. And you are the redeemer of the cosmos. And you have called us to walk with you in the light, to bear witness of the light, to shine that light. You and me, me and you, us and each other. Just as you've taught the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who mutually indwell, mutually impenetrate each other without loss of personhood. I thank you, Father. We're going to dig deeper. Lord, we thank you that you are the righteous judge. And when we know your nature, without any fear, we will cry out, judge us, oh God, for your judgments are righteous and they're always redemptive in their purpose. Heal the deep places of our heart. Remove the trash, remove the roots of bitterness and unforgiveness anger, rejection, and abandonment. The spiritual principles of demonic entities that latch hold of to control and to manipulate to keep your people in darkness. Show them it's all a facade. It's all a masquerade of blindfolds and chains to keep us from walking in the true liberty that's in the spirit. Abba let us know experientially and intimately 
the truth. It's that truth that makes us free. Though you must know it. And we recognize and acknowledge that this is eternal life, that we are to know the Father. Show us the Father. Show us the Son. Show us each other so that we see you. We see them. They see us. Christ in us. The hope of glory. Ah, but I'm asking you to touch the hearts of your people in a magnificent and mighty way. Still stay stickle, stop, but stay on store. I must stay on door. Nicole, was, the Lord is working within you a very prolific understanding of a way that it's almost a strategic way of introducing men and women to the life of God in Christ. A unique style of speaking, writing, very poetic, I, I, I sense, I think, very instrumental to the introduction of the fundamental faith that they are Abba's beloved children. Don't let anybody, including yourself, make light of your calling, for it is a very, very instrumental and powerful calling that dismantles at the very core of the of the believer's life and the unbeliever alike it dismantles the lie that they're not good enough dismantles the lie that god would never come stay with them but it's going to be an ongoing an illuminating revelation of that one revelation in Jesus. You're going to see chains that are going to literally fall off people in the sense when I say literally, I mean the chains that have bound them, they're going to they're going to experience a liberty and a freedom. And what is going to come forth out of that is going to be bodies being healed of cancers, I believe. Bodies being healed of kidneys, I see being healed, I see um, certain blood diseases being healed, such as hepatitis and things such. It's just going to be such a cleansing of the condition of their heart that it's going to bring forth the witness and the testimony of Jesus Christ in their lives, that they become the signs and the wonders that become the talking point or the entrance of light for other salvation. The dreams of the night are not to be ignored. For they're going to be benchmarks of ideas, genius, genius, I'm saying genius strategies that bring forth comfort, peace, tranquility, serenity. Shalom. And ultimately, Shalom. All that you got, God's going to do it. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be powerful in Jesus' name. Shalom is peace. Uh huh. I know. Can I know I, you know. I know you know. That's why I said, "Go ahead, absolutely." I need to say this, and you've already heard this, Lord. I lift up my husband to you first. <laughs> you told me twenty years ago how much he loves me because I got saved. I was living in sin with him. I left him. We got married a year later. We've been married ever since. He saw me laying on the floor, foaming at the mouth for the last five years. I got set free of deaf and dumb. Wow, amen. I'm still dealing with some battery ass that's trying to eat me alive. The spirit of death, all these other, I need a list of demons to, to, to get rid of them. But the Lord said, don't do it, Nicole. I'm going to carry you through the Red Sea. Let go and let me do something in your life. That's the way. That's the best way. And so, um, yeah, I'm just, but Charlie has five guitars. He used to be on the worship team. His email was songs of deliverance, but he quit church. I'm not worried. God, because Charlie does the sweetest things for me, but then he comes in and says, um, he takes away my, um, my credit cards. He took away everything from me. 
And so, and the deaf and gen left in December. So I wanted an appointment with you, Shane, Linda, Raymond, somebody, because I want every demon gone. And, and now I worship off on the corner here at Gateway and Owens. If you don't like it, don't watch me. No more Las Vegas Sin City. We're going to be city of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Nobody else is going to have it. Amen. Amen. I'll shut great. up now. <laughs> well, great testimony. And, um, you know, I believe with all my heart in, in deliverance and casting out demons, something that we see in a lot of in our ministry. But I have also learned, like what you believe the word of the Lord was to you, it's the best way. Let the Lord take you through the Red Sea because it's the emergence from the other side that those things will no longer be able to follow you. Right. That's the, it's the key. It's, it's the, okay, there's an experiment. I, I, I've done this for years, even with a limited knowledge. I'd be preaching and I would talk about light and darkness in the sense that I would turn the lights out in the church on purpose. Say, you know, you can't see your hand in front of your face, but the moment you turn the lights back on, there's no battle. There's no, the darkness isn't trying to hold on. It can't. The key to total ongoing deliverance is when the lights come on. This is why when the unclean spirit leaves a man, he goes to dry places and seeking rest and finding none. He says to himself, I will return from where I came. And he comes bring seven more wicked than himself. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Why? Because he finds it swept. He finds it clean. But what he doesn't find is the lights on. I need to learn that because... Um, I, I just do. I've got to grasp that. Amen. It's um, one step at a time, one day at a time. And this is what's helped me because, listen, you're prof Nicole, I'm also going to say this to you. You're very prophetic in your nature, very prophetic in your nature. And what that, that's a great thing, but the temperament and the nature of prophetic people like myself, like yourself, like Linda, like Raymond, and, we're, and um, probably Heidi and Will, I don't know them as well, but this is something that is true. Prophetic people have the hardest time finding the finding the rest we need in the present because our minds are oftentimes set towards what we perceive in the future and wrestling with what we've walked through in the past. So we feel like we are like like um, in Greek mythology, there's this, this guy named Atlas, you know, the one that holds a globe on his shoulders. It's almost like we feel the weight of everything because we see the future and it almost comes tormenting at times because we either see what God wants to do and then or we see what what will happen if God doesn't intervene or whatever that might be. And then we have another hand in the past. And listen, there's a there's a, something that you're going to get set on is semiotics, Christian future semiotics, is theosemiotics. What this means is the is this is what the sons of Issachar we under they had. He had the ability to, to discern the seasons and the times to know what God wanted them to do, wanted Israel to do, or in our case, the church, what they were able to do when it says seasons and times, they were able to understand by leaning into, not living in, but leaning into understanding the past in a objective light, then they could examine what happened in the past is what ultimately brought them to where they are presently. Then through those two, they can begin to say that what must be changed in order to navigate into either, um, you know, right now we got the probable future, but if we make the necessary movements, advancements, adjustments, then what is probable can turn into what is possible and even preferable for the future. I may have said a lot right there, but it's not as, you know, it's not as, this is not as intense as the South. This is exactly what Jesus was, uh, and the angel was telling John in Revelation 1, when he's write down everything that's going to be, um, what we read in the Greek is signified to the servant John. Signify, signified, symbols, it's um, semiotics, it's signs, the signs that point to something, so the signs are never what we're looking for, the signs are always pointing, so when we talk about even signs and wonders, signs are not miracles, signs ultimately are what points to Jesus, so if it's a miracle, or if it's um, a marriage restored fully, or if it's um, understanding that 
the work of Christ is still working in your husband, even when you can't see it. And then when he acts out, it's only a projection of what he hates about his own self. He's projecting it on you. And it really doesn't have anything to do with you at all. Not typically. I know. I know. So we're going to stand and and we're going to pray. Um, Father, turn his lights on in the darkened places that have been dimmed. And even the places where he has had light, but he's not allowed light to go further. Turn the lights on, Alva, with the first and foremost that God loves him as he is. As in the words of Brandon Manning, God loves him as he is, not as he should be, because nobody is as he should be. Turn the lights on for him, Father, and let him see that he will be who you've called him to be, and he can co labor and partner with his lovely wife in Jesus name. Ooh, telling you. Daniel Michelle asked me if I could repeat that last part, but that was a minute ago. So I have no idea what that last part was she heard. So uh, Daniel, if you could um, um, be a little more specific, I, I, I definitely, well, she might not can be specific since she's asking me to repeat it. So I don't know, I don't know. But listen, one thing I know is God is so good. And it's not, this is, don't mean that in a Christian knees, God is good all the time, all the time. I mean that in the depths of my heart, I have known him to be good. I've known him to be kind. And he doesn't just love me. He doesn't just love you. He likes you. He likes me. He loves your fellowship. He loves your company. He rejoices. He dances with you in it. And it's, yeah. it is a love affair that started that is, Brought so many walls down on me. You know, I'll say this. Is I used to read The Last Supper, and I would see John. He's, he's, he's like, he's got his ear. He's, he's laid on Jesus' chest, kind of like a, like a almost kind of like how a, a girlfriend or, or a husband would hold his wife or his girlfriend like that. And because we have been so twisted in our perception of sexuality, we don't realize what true love looks like. Yeah. That this was the most pierced, beautiful affection of what it is for a creation to see that his creator loves him perfectly. And he found a place of rest where all insecurities were dismantled and he was able to enter into a place of a love affair. You know, sadly, it's the reason why God uses women oftentimes in a spiritual dimension beyond men, because it's easier for women to see this and receive the idea of having a love affair with the creator. So fewer men seem to get it because of some form of insecurity of what manhood should look like. But this has to come down because it's not the kind of love that looks like the twisted, perverted love even when we love the best we know how to love, it's still at some extent limited. But when we recognize that God's love is perfect and we can see God's perfect love in every good and beautiful thing that happens amongst us and amongst creation. Every time we see a beautiful bird whistling a morning song, that's the, good, that's the goodness of God. When we see the beautiful flowers come forth in spring, that is the goodness and the kindness and the grace and the beauty of God. There it is. When we see that God, there you go, must, Shane. that's it. The earth declares. Oh, you wrote that or made yeah. that with the pictures? Well, I didn't know. Uh, the spirit did. I mean, well, you, yes, that I didn't see. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad it's already been happening. And, and I don't want to interrupt, but I, no, um, go ahead. We're just talking. I have over $10,000 worth of that book sitting in the storage facility in San Diego. God's been bringing me through uh, five, six, seven years of Job. Wow. And, and I, if you guys want it, we're, I got my number 17. He changed my birth certificate time to what, 17. Um, uh, what do we need people to do? Just contact you through your inbox messenger? ask linda i I don't know i gotta learn the business side of this listen that's 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 where i'm at listen right now i don't know you know each at the end of each every month i don't know what to do as far as things because i'm not a salesman i'm horrible at it i you know even right right i've I've got books on amazon you never hear me talk about uh, because i don't think that way so it's i get i get that 
I'm a horrible businessman. I just want to tell people about Jesus. And I, God's going to bring people into my life that's going to be able to help say, hey, by the way, this man's got to um, pay his light bill too. So maybe you want to sow a seed. So you don't hear me harping about that kind of stuff. But because I forget about it. Then when afterwards I'm saying, you know, I did have some pressing needs. Maybe I should have asked God's people, invited God's people to sow a seed today because we got bills to pay too. And it's like, oh God, oh God. So, you know, one thing about it, it draws me to the place of saying, okay, there's anxiety still in me that wants to surface. I'm still not trusting you like I need to trust you. But I get that. I get what you're saying. It's like, like, you know how to do it. You, it's your, it's your, the creative genius of the Holy Spirit inside of you that works in you to put the stuff together. But that's why we need each other as well. He doesn't want us to be able to do everything by ourselves. Right. That's not the way the church is designed. I, I, we need each other. Uh, oh, gosh. Um, it's like I just won the spiritual lottery. I claim it and proclaim it. <laughs> because I told Charlie 20 years ago, I said, Charlie, the day is going to come. I said, and right now I'm in my deliverance time because I need to go through victim, orphan, bastard, um, witchcraft, all the stuff that was done to me as a child. And, oh, and the spirit of death too is on, has been on the right side of my body most of my life. I'm, it's, I'm waiting for it to leave. But um, I told Charlie, you're going to have the day come. You're not going to need the deliverance that, I, that I've had you need the healing. You're going to have, I go, there might be a deliverance, but you're going to do the business side of this. And I said, you'll never have to work again. And I said, you're just going to, um, but he doesn't want to quit work. And I've given it to the Lord. I gave my marriage to the Lord and I'm not fighting anymore. That's what you got to do. And listen, there's, I understand as a man, that is so hard to let go because I'm always trying to make something work out because I feel like I'm responsible to do so. And God is saying, you're not trusting me to be your provider. You know, it's almost like this saying, son, I can let you try it, but it's going to work out a lot better if you, if you trust me. And um, so I, I say that just to say, I understand uh, to at least a certain extent, um, Charlie's dilemma, but God will work in him. Like, you right. know, just stay in good faith and, and, and be patient because the Lord's patient and he'll get it all worked out. I believe now that. I do believe that. Yeah. You're acting like God now because the Lord said, uh, Nicole, you have no problem with my with faith. I have, I don't have faith of a mustard seed. I have a faith of a fig or whatever those avocado pit. Faith is Some, listen, is, sometimes I got the faith of the man who said, Lord, I believe help my unbelief. It all depends on what day you catch me on. Yeah. But it I, but I've come to be honest enough to say in those days that I don't feel my faith being strong, I'll say, Lord, I believe help my unbelief, because he's not afraid of that. He already knows where I'm at and then he can help me. Well, Lord, I want to come and wash these people's feet, please. <laughs> wash mm -hmm. their feet and take communion in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, you know, I just want to say something, you know, you know, um, in, in faith, it's, it's patience, you know, and when we lack patience, we lack in faith. I was thinking about what you were saying about when, you know, building especially right there where um in chapter seven now i don't know about you but here in arizona and tucson here we have this thing is called caliche it's like a limestone you only dig a couple of feet down all of a sudden you hit rock bottom i mean rock and what do you have to do you have to soak it in water It'll take several hours. You got to be patient about it. And then you start again and you can start digging a little more deeper. Then you stop and then you got to do the same thing again and again. But you got to have patience, you know, and then you're able to pour that foundation. You know, you what know, else when, I heard when you said that? That, that? When we're digging deep and we hit something hard, make sure that you don't stop thinking it's the rock when it's just a dried up piece of mud that needs to be soaked. Yeah. And so we continue to so there's some hard places that we're going to get. And we don't need to stop there. We have to let the water of the word to soak. Yes. And Amen. then we come back and we'll continue. So it's an event. It's a, it's a journey. It's, don't get in a hurry. Learn how to enjoy each day. Each day. Yes. This is what I believe this is what the Lord means. But we must become like children. 
not 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 old sages. We become like children because children never lose their sense of awe and wonder and their uncanny ability to trust what mom and dad says, even if they don't get it or understand it. I think God's looking for a family of children, not a family of old people. Well, well Shane, I, I want to tell you something, Shane. You need to hear yourself sometimes what you preach. Do you hear me? You need to hear yourself what you preach sometimes because it's how you say what you speak sometimes, it's like you got to put it into your life also. You know, there's some areas where, okay, Shane, you know, speaks this and that, but yet Shane doesn't trust God. <laughs> Shane, Shane doesn't, you know, apply this into him. You know, so many times we preach a gospel that we forget our own selves, our own faith, and to trust God. Trust him, man. I mean, you know, even through the heart, and I know you've been through it. I know you've been through it 20 years. Hey, man, you know, but but there's still some areas there where God's working in you. Absolutely. Thank God you he know? is. He's not he's not done, you know, he's he's often the finisher of faith. And and sometimes God wants to take time to take certain things out, take yes. certain yes. things out, you know, you know, just like Mac. I love the word. I love the check. You know what? There were certain things that Mac had to stuff had to be taken out. Yep. When Sarah you took him into the garden. That's and right. when he saw all these beautiful flowers and everything. And yet she was seeing that she was taking them out, throwing them out. And he was like, what are you doing this for? Because I'm putting something more beautiful in here. But, you know, the spirit spoke to me and he said, you know, that he tends the garden of our soul. Yes. You know, he tends the garden of our soul. So he he's not done, Shane. He's not done. But my thing is, let us all come together and agree that, you know what, that God is going to still be able to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. You know? He'll be working on us all the way through, all the way through this life. And and that's, again, that's why I've learned personally, and that's why I share it so much, that in order for me to stay in that place of trust and rest and wonder and awe, I have to experience him daily in other words i cannot be satisfied with what i experienced yesterday and think that is going to be sufficient for today the old testament type and shadow the tabernacle of moses every single day fresh bread was put in the tabernacle they called yes. it the, they called it the bread of his presence the daily presence or give us this day our daily bread the daily presence is vital for us to be able to live lives of uh, just being whole, healed, and holy, because there's no holiness outside of wholeness. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, and that manifests. So, you take a day that you haven't entered his presence, and next thing you know, something sets you off and you flip, and then you end up giving somebody a piece of your mind, not God's mind. And it happens, but it's because holiness becomes absent from our life because wholeness wasn't present yes. so I've, I've learned this the hard way you know i grew up in the legalistic denominations you know as long as you cut your hair right and you wear the right type of clothes you're holy no my god we're it's pharisaical it's it, we're more we're, they're more concerned about what's on the outside than the inside it's the whole john paul there's my brother hey i didn't expect to see you this is my friend in in canada i think you're in um, um british columbia correct you're muted I'm in Calgary, Alberta. Oh, okay. So, so is that Canada or something? Or yes. Yeah, so, so your family's in British Columbia, then, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, I knew it was something like that. What do the Canadians say? A. <laughs> a. 
a uh, it's a certain movie where they had these two guys from Saturday Night Live. They're Canadians and they're beer drinkers, and they would always say a, you know. <laughs> It's like their lingo. It is their lingo, you know, but amen. Praise what's God. A, what's on your heart, brother? No, I've just been enjoying enjoying this here today. And, and you know, I can almost, what, what Ray said there a few minutes ago about, you know, uh, even, you know, towards you there, Shane, and I think I take that in my own heart. You know, sometimes we can, we can, you know, we know, we know what to, uh, what to say and what God's working in us. And, it's, and, and for myself to be able to trust and believe that all the time because we get to live in our, our lives and uh, what God is speaking to us, but taking that next step and, and applying it, you know, so Shane or Ray, I took that, you know, as a word to, to me as well, too. Amen. 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 Uh, for, the first time I met John Paul was um, uh, ministering for a dear, dear friend of both of ours, Manfred North Pagan, um, the, He's a, um, a pastor or an apostolic leader in um, Brockett, south of Calgary, and um, created the, the Blackfoot Nation. And, um, you know, we had fun talking about Android and Apple phones. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think like the argument between Apple and Android is almost like somebody who is arguing doctrine over presence. You know, until they have until they really have an Apple product, they don't have an argument. So, you know, so it's usually, you know, I, I give you a hard time, but no, I. I, you know, Apple's awesome. I, I, I know that. You know, and, and Shane, I feel like you and I go back, you know, a, quite a few years, you know, 10 plus years. And, you know, it's great to kind of see, you know, what's God, what God is doing in you. And, and I'm just blessed all the time. And I'm glad that this is happening here right now. And to seeing, you know, God launch you in a full new, different direction. And that's just fantastic. Thank you, sir. It's been it's been interesting. It's been worth it, but it's been, it's been, um, been hard, but it's been worth it. You gonna, you gonna play us a song? I don't, I just been kind of, uh, as you've been, uh, been ministering, just, just been uh, strumming away a little bit as well too. So a str- pl- strum something for us, play something for us. <laughs> You know, you, you said a word, um, was it a week ago? You let us through a prayer of be be still and know that I am God. Yes. And over this past um, week, and even just today, I'm starting to feel something in my heart and this guitar on that about being still. And I, I don't have it yet, but but uh, there's something there. So thank you. That's, yes, sir. And remember, it remembers the goal of that exercise is to be still and know that I am God, be still and know that I am. So that removes all the, I am not side of your life. That's right. You should remove all the, I am not side of your life. Be still and know that I am be still and know. And then it's be still. still. Then it's just be. And I can't, but for me, that's so beautiful because it brings me back to John one. All things came into being. Without him, nothing came into being that is in being. And I think of Athanasius when he says, we who came out of non-being into being, ultimately because God loved us so much, he sent the son so that through sin and death, we don't go back into the place of non-being. Right. So to, to be is to be in union with him. They got that they they put out some flags, but you stop playing. <laughs> you know, Shane, I'm gonna tell you something now. I'm gonna tell you something. When when you said that that day, that line, there was sounded in my spirit. And there were certain parts in my life that needed healing. And to speak those words 
and then to speak it again, and then again, and then at the last part, and be. You know, there were areas that uh, God was healing me. I mean, you don't understand. Those aren't just mere words. That those are words of inner healing. Yeah. You know, those yes. are words of inner healing when when you know be still and know I am God. Be still and know I am. Yes. That's it. Be still. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, and it touched me and it healed me and I just and, you know, I used that the other night when I was speaking because the Lord told me, there's people that are hurting and they need to know me, that I am. And uh, it really wow. resonated in me. You don't understand. If it resonates in me, I can imagine it resonates in the body of Christ for those that are hurting. You know, it's funny, it's funny, you know, that the Lord can use use me as a, in the gift of healing, in the gift of inner healing. And yet I have my, yes. my brokenness and also my physical, you know, healing that I need. But I know that I, you know, you know, like that old song, it is well with my soul, yes. you know, it is well. But those words you spoke that night, something resonated in me. And it just touched me and I just wanted to share because those aren't words that we're just speaking. These are words that are healing and bringing forth life, you know? So, yeah, amen. Amen, amen. No, I was gonna ask John the strum just moment. I think Linda's got that one. My sister um bought me that. Um, I don't know if y'all can see it. Yeah. Can you see what it is? It looks like almost like an angel. It's hard to see here like this. Um this is my TV. Okay. I can see that there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. The Trinity. It's, oh, the cross, it's the cross, but it's and then the Holy Spirit's above his head, and then the Father with his hands outstretched is behind him wow. with him. And this is God was in Christ, <laughs> reconciling the world to himself. The hurting, those who have been abandoned, feels like they've been rejected they got to know that the centrality of the message of jesus christ is that god the father the son and the holy spirit was together in our redemption they were together in their love for us and it was never about changing god's mind about us it was always about changing our minds about god he loves his creation so much. And he hates sin. That's why God, God does have wrath. But wrath isn't because he's mad at people. Wrath is because he hates the sin that destroys his people. So his wrath is his love that burns against everything that doesn't look like his love. That doesn't look like the image of a son. Because ultimately... We are to be his image bearers, and sin, it mars his image in us, so he's after it with abandonment, passion, furious, the furious love of Abba, the relentless tenderness of Jesus. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love doesn't remember, doesn't even remember the wrong done. He remembers no wrong. It holds no account. It's just forgiving. It's scandalous. The gospel, the gospel is scandalous. It is foolishness. It's foolishness to the Gentiles. 
They don't, the, the nations, they see it as, it's foolish to the nations. Why? Because it's so scandalous because we are been taught and it's ingrained in us that we got to do something in order for us to be accepted. We've got to first do something in order for us to be loved. We have to, we have to make ourselves worthy and deserving of love. And that is not the love of God. We, it's, a, it's a scandal. The woman called the act of adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Here's a book on how to get inner healing. No, he's going to say inner healing is going to begin in you now. And this is the point of the healing. I don't condemn you. I don't reject you. I love you. I posted something today and I made another one of those graphics about St. Fatini. I read her history this morning. She's the apostle. She was considered by the Orthodox Church equal with the apostles. Mm-hmm. Sorry, men who don't like women to be apostles. It has nothing to do with being a father or a mother. It has to do with being the sent one. And she was sent by Jesus after her encounter at the well. And she evangelized along with her sisters were converted. Her brothers were converted. She had two sons, according to the tradition, that were converted. And these, this family turned Samaria upside down. All, all the way up to the point of her martyrdom where Nero had her thrown into a well because she got, he got tired of hearing about the man who told her everything she had ever done that she had encountered at that well. That encounter set the course for healing to a whole entire region. Raymond, you are, you are a special gift of God to the body has nothing to do with who articulates this way, who studies. It's the heart of Father. And it's the relentless tenderness of Jesus that I see you, my friend. That's why God uses you to heal, even in spite of your own afflictions. Because at the end of it all, you know, in a lot of your own afflictions, that it wasn't by might and it wasn't by power, but it was by his spirit. No, you're a gift, my brother. I love you. I thank God for you. I'm so I'm so thankful to call you my friend. You know, that's that's one thing that I love about taking the opportunity to be able to come online and to speak God's word is because I love God's people and I love them all, but I love the broken. I love the rejected. I love those that can't and don't want to go to church anymore. That this gives them an opportunity when they come to hear the word of God and they come to get healed. And then to say, you know what? I think I'm able to go back into the church now. But for this moment, I'm going to stick right here because these men, these women of God, they got something to speak and they're speaking more truth here than in the pulpit. And I, I thank God for men and women, even you, Brother Shane, you know, that we have a heart to reach to those that can't go that don't want to go, but they're finding their healing here in these places, you know, and, and, and that's why I do what I do. That's why I love to preach the word. Like you said, you know, you're, you're a more articulated man than me. I'm just uh, kind of funny, you know, you know, I'm more of a farmer boy, <laughs> you know, I always, I always say that, <laughs> but it's true, you know, I'm just simple, but yet it reaches the last amount. And what we're in another thing, we're making a difference in, in the kingdom of God. It's not in vain what we're doing. And we're seeing lives transform. Matter of fact, there was a man, he was trying to get on. He he wanted to give his life to the Lord right here today. And I hope that he comes back or that we get in contact with him. Just because he was hearing you speak, Jane. I actually have his details, Raymond. So I know he's talking about 
Shane, we will go out and we will. I will make a chat thing and we will. We will help him. We will definitely help him. But he messaged me yesterday as well. You know, so praise God. That's the difference we make here. Amen. Amen. I'm going to uh, ask John to um, play him in. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to, I can leave it going. I'm. We're going to be leaving here out of here in a few moments. We're going to go to um, Crestview. Um, um, we got to try to get a couple things taken care of to make it up there. And um, um, Dan Muller is preaching. He preached last night. I was, we we're going to go last night. just weren't able to make it. But Dan Muller is a, a phenomenal, you know, he reminds me of a modern day Brennan Manning. He's just, He's just a man who's been baptized with a furious love of God, and, and it pours out of him. So if you guys don't know who he is, you can look him up on YouTube. He's pretty well known, and I'm, I'm excited. So we're going to um, go right out there, Crestview, and um, get up under that fountain that's coming out of him tonight. And um, I believe it's going to be a, a great a great time, you know, refreshing. And me, Lisa, and my oldest son's going. So I'm looking forward to that, and we're going to um, head out that way in just a few moments. But um, I want all y'all know how special you are and how much every one of you mean to me. Just the fact that you're here um, it means more to me than you know. And I, I talk cheap sometimes, I know, but it's from my heart. I love you guys. John, if you want to um, strum a moment um, while they, because those flags, I could feel the presence of God, as weird as it sounds, just from the flag waving. And not even hear it, just seeing it. There's something to it. Something to it that I don't quite understand, though I've seen it for years and years, but there is something powerful in it. Be still and know that I be still and know that I am. You are God. Be still and know that I am God. First year. Mm-hmm. 
your presence in our hearts, Lord. Fill us, Lord, with your presence in your spirit. We're still for you.
so good. Just be loved and be loved. Even when we don't understand. Shane. Thank you so much, Shane. I it's a great honor to know you. It's a great honor of you asking Raymond and I to, to join you every time you do go live. It's a great honor, everybody, just being here. The Holy Spirit just moved. John, you are amazing. I just want to lift you up as well. You're an amazing worshiper. The Holy Spirit is going to use you more powerfully in all different areas and different platforms. I don't know if you are doing that right now. Even in church buildings, you are going to even on, you know how you got tent revivals? Like, I don't, yeah, you're going, God is going to use, I don't know if he's done that in you, but I can see that you're already done something like that or you're going to do it very soon. Um. If it's all right with Shane that you reach out to me, I have reached out to Shane personally as well to see where your availabilities are. And I love to Shane to actually come and join, even preach more. <laughs> Glory to God. And you women, I bless you both with all your gifts and your dancing that you have brought the Holy Spirit to break out. I have to go because Shane needs to go. Glory to God. Love, love you all.